please welcome Brian Stevenson. I spend a lot of time in jails and prisons. I spend a lot of time with people who live in the margins of our society. I spend a lot of time with the poor. And I'm persuaded that there is more we can do to create a healthier environment, a more just society. And I actually think that justice is good for everybody. I think that a healthier environment where no one feels excluded, no one feels ignored, no one feels disfavored is good for everyone. And I don't think we've made the kind of progress that we could make if we did some things differently. Because my work has been in the criminal justice system, I've seen some really tragic developments over the last half century. Many of us have been taught that if there's a bad part of town, oh, don't put your business there. Don't visit that part of town. Stay as far away from that segment of the community as possible. I am persuaded we need to do the opposite. We need to find ways to engage and invest and position ourselves in the places where there is despair. I actually think when we situate ourselves next to people who are excluded and marginalized and disfavored and left out, at a very minimum, we can find collective and institutional and meaningful ways to embrace these communities. And sometimes it is that witness that can be transformative. I started working with children who had been prosecuted as adults and in proximity to these communities, I discovered some things that I couldn't discover absent proximity. I got involved in a case of a 14-year-old boy who lived in a household where his mother would sometimes be the target of domestic violence. Uh, this boy's mother uh, had a boyfriend and when that man would start drinking, he'd get violent. And one day, the man had been drinking, and he came home, and he called the boy's mother into the kitchen. She walked into the kitchen, and the man went up to her, and he just punched her in the face. She fell down. She hit her head as she fell. She was on the floor bleeding and unconscious. Her son came running into the kitchen to help his mom. He tried to revive her. He tried to stop the bleeding. But after 10 minutes, she was still non-responsive, and that little boy thought his mom was dead. The man went into a bedroom, and he fell asleep. The little boy got up, he walked into the bedroom, he was going to call the police, he was going to call an ambulance, but then he remembered that this man kept a handgun in his dresser drawer. So he walked over to the drawer, he pulled out the gun, he walked over to where the man was sleeping, he pointed the gun at the man's head. The man was snoring, and when the man stopped snoring and jumped, the little boy jumped, and when the little boy jumped, he pulled the trigger and shot the man in the head, killing him instantly. It was very tragic. This little boy was very small for his age, he was under five feet tall, he weighed less than 100 pounds. He'd never been in trouble before. Uh, he was the kind of kid that might have been tried as a juvenile, but for the fact that the man that he shot and killed, his mother's boyfriend, well, that man was a deputy sheriff. And because he was a deputy sheriff, the prosecutor insisted that this child be tried as an adult. And the judge certified him to stand trial as an adult, and they immediately placed him in the adult jail. He'd been there three days before I got involved in the case, and I went to the jail to see this little boy. And when he walked in, I was stunned by how terrified he looked. He sat down, and I, I began asking him questions, but no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't say anything. He just sat there. I finally put my pen down, and I said, look, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. You've got to talk to me. The little boy wouldn't say anything. He just continued sitting there. He was staring at the wall, not saying a word. I got up, and I moved my chair close to him, and I, and I just tried to get him to talk. I said, come on, you've got to talk to me, and he wouldn't say anything. I couldn't figure out what to do, and at some point, I just leaned on him. I don't even know why, but I leaned on him, and when I leaned on him, he leaned back. And when he leaned back, I put my arm around him, and I said, come on, you've got to talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And that's when this little boy started to cry. And through his tears, he began talking to me, not about what happened with the man, not about what happened with his mom, but he started talking to me about what had happened at the jail. He told me on the first night several men had hurt him. He told me on the next night he'd been sexually assaulted by several people. He told me on the night before I'd gotten there, so many people had hurt him, he couldn't remember how many there had been. And I held this little boy while he cried hysterically for almost an hour. I finally got him calm. I said, look, I'm going to get you out of here. You stay right here. And I will never forget trying to leave that jail. And that little boy grabbed me by the arm and he said, please, please don't go. Please don't go. I said, no, it's okay. It's all right. I'm going to get you out of here. And when I left the jail, the question I had in my mind is, who is responsible for this? And the answer is, we are. We've allowed this distance to be created from some of the most vulnerable people in our society. 
On any given day in this country, there are 10,000 children being housed in adult jails and prisons where they're at great risk. We've allowed narratives to emerge that separate us from some of these children. And I believe proximity is the solution because you in that space would react just like I did. I'm the product of someone's choice to get proximate. I don't talk about proximity just from an intellectual perspective. I grew up in a community where black children could not go to the public schools. When I was a little boy, I had to go to the colored school. They didn't let black kids go to the public schools. When my dad was a teenager, there were no high schools for black children in our county. And then lawyers came into the community and made them open up the public schools. They enforced Brown versus Board of Education. And because those lawyers chose to get proximate to poor black kids like me, I got to go to high school. I have no illusions about the fact that I would not be standing here if those lawyers hadn't gotten proximate to poor black kids like me. But because they did, I got to go to high school. I got to go to college. Nobody in my family had gone to college. When I got to college, it was like entering this world I didn't know existed. I loved college. I got proximate. I started working with lawyers that represented people on death row. I started working with children who had been prosecuted as adults. And in proximity to these communities, I discovered some things that I couldn't discover absent proximity. I think ultimately what we do to get proximate to those who are disfavored and excluded, what we do to change narratives, what we do to stay hopeful, what we do that is inconvenient and uncomfortable can sometimes be the most meaningful thing we do. It is how we honor what it means to have responsibility, to have opportunity, to have privilege. I believe really simple things. I believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And that's the reason why I represent the condemned the incarcerated. I believe if someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. If someone takes something, they're not just a thief. And that justice requires we know the other things they are. I am persuaded that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. Sometimes I think we talk too much about money. I am persuaded that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. I believe the opposite of poverty is justice. And when we do justice, we deconstruct the conditions that give rise to poverty. I actually think we're going to be judged not by how we treat the wealthy, and the privilege, I think we're going to be judged by how we treat the poor, the excluded, and the neglected. And in that context, there's something meaningful and rich waiting for us.